So, um, you've mentioned that your mother, I believe, was a Democrat. Yes. You used to be a Democrat. Well, I grew up listening to my mom, and so you kind of tend to grow up the way your parents are. So what led you to, to become a Republican? It's interesting because uh, I, I was very much against corruption growing up in Chicago. I, my mom experienced it and, and saw the effects of it in the Chicago public school system. And uh, then uh, I started working. Uh, I, I, I became a CPA when I was 20 years old, and I started seeing people uh, paying tax at 70% marginal tax rates. And I started seeing this, the kind of stupid things they were doing, frankly, to try to avoid paying tax and uh, making investments that weren't economic and done primarily for tax avoidance purposes. And that the tax code at the time really allowed a lot of that legally. So uh, I worked at an international public accounting firm called Coopers and Library. And so I did a lot of tax returns for high net worth individuals. And, uh, you know, I started to, to, to think and, and hear about Ronald Reagan and about Jack Kemp and people talking about reducing tax rates and that being a key to economic growth. Um, I was steeped in small business because I did a lot of work for a lot of small businesses. I did their tax returns. I did their accounting. And uh, I, would, I would talk to a lot of business people about their experiences with regulation and about the uh, difficulties that they had of complying with the tax system and dealing with regulation and dealing with uh, lawsuits and things like that and the difficulties of, you know, doing business. And so that really, you know, when Ronald Reagan talked about unleashing the private economy and reducing tax rates, reducing regulation, and allowing growth, and allowing innovation, and, you know, uh, encouraging those kinds of things. Uh, that, that appealed to me I, I, because of what I was seeing right in front of me doing work for small businesses. Right. So after you made that transition, <laughs> yeah. for a better word, yeah. um, how did you talk to your mother about politics? We had wonderful discussions, and you know, but my mom, you know, my mom loved me, and she was steeped in in politics. Uh, you know, when I was six years old, she, you know, I used to imitate John F. Kennedy, um, and uh, my mom loved it. I mean, and the more my mom was happy about it, the more I wanted to do it. Right? I mean, you always want to please your mother, especially because my mom was the you know major breadwinner of the family. I mean, she was the dominant figure in the family, so you know, I always wanted to please her and. You know, I don't know if you study birth order, but I was the second child. Uh, so the, uh, the first, my, my older brother Michael was kind of the, you know, the, 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 the fair-haired child, as it were, you know, and I was always trying to get my mom's attention. And, you know, so that's why I was more involved in politics and the things that she liked, uh, per se. Uh, but we had wonderful discussions about politics. I mean, uh, she didn't agree with me. I mean, uh, and I, I would try to persuade her <laughs> of what, what I was talking about, and she had some sympathies. Uh, you know, she certainly agreed with me on the need to do something about political corruption, because that was something that really touched her significantly in terms of her professional life. Hmm. Professionally or politically, what, what's the most difficult thing you've had to do? Oh, boy. Raise children. Hmm. <laughs> I don't know if you have children, but it's uh, it's it's a it's a difficult thing every single day because you've got to make decisions that you know are going to have an impact on a life going forward, and you don't know how it's going to turn out. Um, but you know, I've done a lot of, you know, I think what are important things in my life in terms of starting a business and starting charities and being involved. You know, I mean, getting married <laughs> was. Not that tough. Uh, <laughs> that was kind of wonderful, uh, but um, I would I would say trying to raise children is, is is a pretty pretty difficult thing in terms of the decision making you have to do. Right. You've mentioned that you started businesses. You're a lawyer. You're a CPA. You've run for office a number of times. Right. What do you do for fun? <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, I started out as, in life as a tennis pro. Interestingly really? enough, yeah, I. Um, I worked my way through college teaching tennis to uh, people. Uh, I always say that in 1974, I was making $20 an hour teaching tennis, and my buddies were working at McDonald's making $2 an hour. So that was not a bad gig. Um, but uh, I'm kind of self-taught in tennis. Uh, but then I got into golf, so I, I play a lot of golf. I, I just love walking golf courses and being on the grass and looking at the sky and the birds and 
chasing a little white ball. <laughs> um, on that, I mean, I, mean uh, I mentioned that you, you run for office a number of times. You run for Congress, and Senate, and President. Um, now you find yourself uh, second in, in the most recent polls. Uh, yeah. Uh, how do you? Feel, I mean, do you feel surprised that you, well, you made this far now? You know, I always want to have an impact, and, and of course, whether that's in the charitable realm, starting a charity, or being on the board of the USO, uh, which I was in Chicago as well as here in San Diego. Uh, I've, I've never not been involved. I mean, I've been involved in my church. I mean, I. I was on the school board of my church when I was 22 years old, uh, so I, I've always not been, I've always been involved. So uh, the congressional thing came up because I, you know, there was a vacancy and I decided to do it. And then uh, people asked me to to think about running, you know, in for other positions. And since I had a decent background, they asked me to do it. It's not my fault that I lived in a congressional district that was pretty deeply blue, and I was a conservative, so it was pretty tough to get elected. And the same thing in Cook County, it was pretty tough to get elected, but uh, I've always had a desire to, to have a voice and, and add my voice and my ideas and, and you know, see what I could do to help the, uh, the body politic. Um, if you could recommend one book to every Californian, what would it be? Oh, you're rubbing. Oh, okay. <laughs> we'll stop rubbing. No rubbing. No rubbing. Uh, you know, I think the, a book that really impacted me was uh, uh, Free to Choose by Milton Friedman. Uh, you know, the, the power of freedom and the human uh, search for excellence, uh, to me, uh, it, is so much more powerful. And, and it kind of fits with the way I view government. I certainly think government is essential and, and government is important. but. When government gets too much involved and is too stifling to individual liberty and individual freedom, uh, I think that uh, inhibits progress. I really do. And uh, I want progress, just like everybody. I think I want uh, an elevation of our living standards. I want better schools. I want better roads. I want better quality of life for people. And I see uh, most, many times government is an inhibitor of the progress that we see. And that's certainly at variance with some people's view, but uh, Milton Friedman would, you know, would point out, you know, uh, so many examples of situations where human spirit unleashed could accomplish so much more than a government directive of some sort. And, and I really truly believe that today. And I frankly think that's one of the main problems going on in California today. You're initially from Illinois, but you moved to California. What? Just like Pete Wilson and Ronald, Ronald Reagan. So. All right. Good company. <laughs> yeah. What do you think the rest of the country gets wrong about California? Well, I don't know. That's a good question. Uh, lately, I think California has been in, in the news uh, too much in a negative fashion. Frankly, I think the the, the business climate, the uh, rule of law issues with sanctuary state, uh, you know, the fights with the president. Uh, I think those are probably negative. Um, I think people look at California as creative and clearly with Hollywood, with Silicon Valley. Uh, and I might add, by the way, our agricultural community has advanced quite substantially as well with a lot of creativity. Believe it or not, you can, you know, crop yields and things are, can be very creative. Uh, we have a thriving biotech industry in my home county of San Diego. So, uh, and of course, the port of Los Angeles is one of the biggest ports and most important ports of entry in the entire country. So I think people around the country sometimes dismiss California as, you know, a little kooky. Uh, on the other hand, I think it's the most important state in the country in terms of its history, in terms of its record of innovation, and in terms of its impact on the economy. And I, I tell audiences that I believe the job I'm running for is the second most important job in the country, and, and I, I truly believe that. And, and it requires a serious person, and it requires uh, 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 a certain you know level of maturity and, and, and seriousness that, that, that hopefully I'll bring to it. Okay. Well, on that note, I want to thank you for humoring us with this, and we'll okay. to the big table. And well, not a lot of humor in that, but... Uh, <laughs> Thank you very much. Oh, there's someone on the line I haven't met. Hello. Unmute Julie. Yeah, Julie Carts. I'm in Los Angeles. Oh, hi, Julie. Julie covers the environment for us. Okay. All right. We're ready whenever you're okay. ready to go. Great.
Great. So, you know, I'll, I'll start, um, I, I'll tell you a little bit, we're doing a project called What Happened to the California Dream, or <laughs> working Cal Matters with uh, several radio stations and newspapers all over the state for the next two years on this project. And so, you know, it's about some of the stuff we talked about coming up here. But, sure. Um, the anxiety that people are feeling about mm -hmm. being able to get ahead and, and uh, you know, the challenges to make things work. Uh, it's, there are national issues here, but in California, there are several areas where we appear to be an outlier on things like housing prices, on, on things like income inequality. We're wider than the, the nation. Which the, is somewhat related to housing prices yep. to a great degree. Yeah, and the, and the poverty rate here. Uh, so, Which is also uh, related to housing prices to a great uh -huh. degree, yes. <laughs> so I, I, just when you hear that story, what is it that you think, how did we get here in California? And then as governor, you know, what are two things you would do to respond to that? Well, I, you know, if I look at what's happened to California over the last 30 years, uh, and I, I, I witnessed it back in Illinois as well, it's the, it's the growth of the power of special interests, uh, uh, people that have an agenda and are able to get it uh, uh, enacted in the state legislature and with the governors. Uh, and, and I think if you look at the last 30 years in, in this state in particular, which I've studied quite extensively, uh, you can see that the, the power and influence of these special interests. You know, the reason the status quo is the status quo is because somebody likes it and somebody likes it to be that status quo. And it's not always the best thing for all the people in the state. And in, in most cases, the person who wants the status quo to be that way is making money from the status quo, has some element of power or some economic power associated with keeping the status quo the status quo. So how have the special interests contributed to these conditions though, do you think? Well, because they have benefited in some form or fashion from the policies that have enacted. Let's take housing because it's, it's one of my favorite topics. As you know, I'm in the housing industry. Uh, I build a, a, apartments for $80,000 a unit in Indiana. Uh, and obviously, you know here, it's far, far higher. Now, obviously, the price of land is a differentiating factor between here and Indiana, but it, it's the regulations, the, the environmental regulations, the impact fees, and all the other costs that go into building that are just so astronomical here relative to other states. And I have, I want to tell you, I've had first-hand experience with that. I've sat down with developers here and obviously I do my own development in Indiana. Um, there, the interest groups have a play in that because they are the ones that wanted those laws put in for some reason. Many a times it's just the outgrowth of the fact that they are in the fundraising business they have to show results to the people who give them money. And oftentimes those results take the form of regulations and laws that you know, benefit a certain outlook or a certain view, uh, real or imagined. I mean, you know, most of the time I suspect it's real, but maybe it's inflated. You know, fundraising is an interesting thing because fundraising, uh, you've got to appeal to people's emotion to get them to write a check a lot of times and you're not going to maybe do that with sober reflection and sober thought and so a lot of these fundraisers will you know potentially inflate problems and make them seem far more serious and they, and they won't discuss with the people who are you know they're, who they're asking for money they won't discuss cost benefit analysis and the risk and rewards of certain procedures They'll just tell somebody, if you don't give me a check right now, fish are going to die and the forests are going to turn yellow or, you know, or decay or other things like that. They, they create an atmosphere of fear in order to raise money. Then they have to do something with that money and so they take that money and they use it to, to, to get legislation passed. They fund campaigns and things and so that's how they get their power. That dynamic, you think you, we can see that behind income inequality? Behind we can see that behind, behind, behind we can uh, see that behind housing prices because we can see that a lot of the regulations that are put in place are done in the context of that fundraising and that purchase of legislation per se. Mm -hmm. uh, that in turn results in a higher cost for a house. Remember the cost of housing is probably the largest single 
element of any family's budget. Uh, and so if the cost of housing is higher, it's more likely that that person is, has difficulty meeting other expenses, which means, again, they're put into poverty. Uh, that difference in housing cost also then is reflected in the inequality because they're spending so much of their money on housing, they don't have as much to spend on education and other things like that, and, and it impedes their progress and that wage gap and that, that cost of living gap grows. And circling back, it circles back to that regulation that drove up the cost of housing or resulted in, in, it, in it being a, a problem for a family. Mm -hmm. Good, well we have uh, other housing questions. Uh, yeah. Gonna yeah. yeah, yeah. Yeah, so just to continue on that, or rent control, I know uh, you're not a fan, but... Uh, well, if you look at the history of price controls, rent control is another price control. You know, uh, Nixon put in price controls in the 70s, remember, to try to stop inflation, and it didn't work. So voters might have the option on the ballot in November to overturn Costa Hawkins. Which, right. Yeah. I'm aware of that. And, and so do you think, even though you oppose rent control, should cities have the opportunity to impose those ordinances if they want to? Well, I hope we would get leaders who would want to solve the problem with best practices. I mean, again, if you look around the world and you look and you know anything about economic history, you know that the history of price controls is not good. They, they never, ever work. You get less investment. You know, the, the, the issue with housing in this state is uh, not enough investment, not too much, not, you know, misplaced investment, plainly not enough investment. And if you put rent controls on, uh, you're going to get even less. There, there are other alternatives people can do with their money. So it's a not, free world. So you're not support that? Value. Absolutely not. I, I want to see affordable housing. I want to see the cost of housing come down. And, you know, the, the law of supply and demand has not been repealed. The, the only way to truly bring down the cost of any good or any service is with competition and supply. Okay. So, um, about SB 27, that's Scott Wiener's bill that would upzone around transit areas. Um, you were asked about it at a recent debate, and you said, we ought to have more local control, but in certain areas we're going to have to build and have more density. So how do you have both? How do you? I, I think I think we need to have leadership again that looks at solving the problem, and that's local leadership as well as state leadership. I'm not a fan of a top-down, one-size-fits-all state edict. I mean, this is a state of 40 million people. It's got literally hundreds, if not thousands, of local units of government. Uh, the idea that the state government is going to impose their will. And you know, things that are imposed from on high often don't work because the, the local parties don't buy in. You, you need to have people buy in at a local level in order to get something to be effective. And so what I'd like to do is do it through leadership as opposed to regulation and, and force from uh, on high. So how do you get people to buy in at the local level? Again, I think it's leadership. I think it's trying to work with people on solving a problem. The, the problem is we don't have enough housing, which has driven the cost up. L limited supply, good demand, thank God we have good demand, uh, means that the price goes up. That's the law of supply and demand. And the only way that's effective to get that to, to change and to make it more affordable for more people. You know, my opponents in this race are all about more subsidies, handouts to a few people, and it's relatively few people that are able to help with that. I want to have solutions that, 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 that help millions of people. I don't want to just help, you know, help a few. And making housing more affordable is something that, you know, will help you know, more people and will will help. By the way, and I've said this many times, I'm a CPA and I, I understand financial statements. And a major, major cost of every government unit is salaries. Think about it. Probably 95%, right? You know, governments don't buy a lot of raw material. They really buy labor. And, you know, and so, if the labor cost is pushed up because of housing costs, people need more to live to pay for housing, the cost of housing is driving up the cost of all of our budgets at every single level, from school districts 
to cities, to counties, to the state government. It's also driving up the cost of business. I, I met with a manufacturer down in, uh, uh, I think it was in Alpine, down in San Diego County, and he has a small manufacturing business, maybe 90 employees. None of his competitors are in California. But he's got to pay higher and higher salaries to get and retain people because they can't afford a house. And that's driving his costs higher, which to the point of he's almost non-competitive with, with the rest of his competitors. And if California could just function on its own as a single economy without having to sell to the rest of the world, I'd say that might not be that bad, but it's not. We have to sell to the rest of the world. And if our businesses and our governments are uncompetitive because the salaries are being driven up by these excess housing costs, uh, that's why I hit on housing at every speech I give because it's it's a very very fundamental issue. So questions on another fundamental issue, education. And yeah. More specifically, the achievement gap that has existed in this state for thirty years between our poor kids and our wealthier students. What would you do to begin to narrow it? Why am I a good CPA? Why am I a good investment advisor? I have an investment advisory firm. Why do my why do I keep my apartments wonderful? And they are wonderful, by the way. They are. They're clean and well-kept and up-to-date and everything else. Why do I do that? Because I know that if I don't, my tenants, my clients, my customers go elsewhere. They, they, they switch. They go and move to another you know, apartment you know, uh, property community or they, they find another accountant or whatever. You know. That, that don't, doesn't exist in the school system to some degree, you know. Uh, competition is what makes people quality. Competition is why I get up every single day wanting to be better than the next guy. And that competition is not available in our education system. And it's, I think it's horrendous. I think it's, our education system it, it has been in prior years the envy of the nation in California. It's not today. Uh, Dan Walters, I know, wrote re just just the other day about this in your, you know, in one of your pieces. Uh, uh, it's horrendous. I read in the Chronicle too. Shouldn't mention competitor, uh, but about a kid that. Oh, they're your partner. Wonderful. Uh, you know, about a kid that was p promoted all the way through despite getting Fs on every single report card he ever got. What's a parent to do if they they don't? If they don't, you know, like what the school does, or they don't have uh, the quality that they want, or the achievement that they want, you know, how can these schools keep existing and keep getting funded every time? So it Competition. Like you're talking about school choice. Absolutely, and that is uh, vouchers to be sure. But I'm I'm a fan of school, school vouchers, vouchers. Uh, and charters. But I mean, I believe in giving people a choice. It's the only real way that we're going to you know, improve. And gosh, you know, homeschooling is a wonderful alternative too. My, my brother homeschooled his three sons. My nephews are three of the most well-educated, wonderful. Now, it's not for everybody. Uh, you know, got to make sure that parents are responsible and do the responsible thing with their, you know, obviously my brother and his wife, you know, he, they were both CPAs and you know. Well, homeschooling surely I don't think is the answer for many of our no. four students. Oh, God, no, no, and, no, and So sort no. of on that note, um, the governor, Governor Brown's um, answer or response to how to lift up four students was to invest in them through the local control funding formula. How well do you think that program is working? You know, throwing more money or reallocating money is, is, is okay, but it's not going to it's not going to get to the fundamental issue. The fundamental yes, issue sir. is a failing school has to fail and, and, and give the parents a chance to go somewhere else. Just like if you've got a lousy accountant, you've got to be able to go somewhere else. And uh, I understand why the teachers' unions fight that at every turn. They want power. I mean, I don't blame them. My mom was a member of the teachers' unions. I'm not anti-union one iota. I certainly believe in collective bargaining, but, but I don't believe in the power uh, you know that, that that that's uh, you know that's uh, that, that's wielded by them or any other special interest or any of the big business as far as that goes. Um, what we ought to have is a system that allows as much competition and choice, and then we'll get the best schools, and then we'll have the best. Uh, 
And I think government has a role in, in exercising some level of oversight to make sure that the results are there. And transparency. See, that's the other is issue here. Parents, I really truly believe that parents are good judges of what their kids are doing. At the end of the day, they're the ones that really care about whether their kids are successful or not. We all care that kids are successful, but the parents care the most. And um, so transparency, you know, being able to give parents the full information on exactly what they, you know, are getting from their school and how well their child is achieving and what alternatives there are if they're not. Can I ask how that would work? Let's say you have two parents in San Francisco and one of them is a good core parent and mm -hmm. then one is a parent in the Presidio. So a nice private school in San Francisco that would give them a quality education might be, let's say, $30,000 a year. So if the state's giving vouchers, do you give vouchers to the rich family too, as well as the poor family? And even if you give vouchers, the state can't afford to pay for that full education. So doesn't that leave the poor kid in the same situation? Well, you can't equalize results. I, mean, I don't believe in government equalizing results. But you certainly can give people an opportunity for a great education. And maybe it does, it's not as good an education as somebody that has wealth. Uh, you know, my, uh, you know, my family was not wealthy. My mom was a single mom raising four kids. Um, but she had a choice. She moved out to the suburbs and, you know, got, it was before Chicago required teachers to live in the city, by the way. Uh, so she, she wasn't going to, you know, I was, I was actually, the first five years of my life, I lived at Prairie Shores, which is right, right outside downtown Chicago, south side, you know, relatively poor area. It was a, it was a high rise, you know, affordable, you know, housing apartment. Uh, but then she wanted to make sure I had a good education, so she moved to uh, you know a, a, a suburb that had a, a decent education program. Now, it wasn't Winnetka's. You know, Winnetka is a very wealthy suburb on the north shore of Chicago that probably spends, like you said, huge amounts per kid. But it was it was good. The education I got was was decent because in those days, you know, there were teachers that really cared about what they were doing and they made sure that I t learned and of course my mother did too. My mother had a lot of say over what I, what I did. Uh, so, so my mom exercised her choice and was able to move out to the suburbs and because she had a decent job and she was able to do that. But you know, you're right, a, a parent in the inner city in Los Angeles, in the barrio, doesn't have that option to move to a suburb. It's too expensive. So a voucher for them that gives them a chance to go to a competitive school in that neighborhood would be a great thing. And it may not be as good as the school in Santa Monica or Brentwood, but it'll be probably a good site better than the existing school that isn't competitive. Do the state vouchers go to the Bel Air families sending their kids to Well, I think everybody... Everybody gets the same yeah, amount? Yeah, I think, I think, I think, you know, listen, I'm not going to sit here and tell you I have all the answers about how voucher systems would be structured. You know, what, what you need to know is that that I'm not an expert on everything, you know, despite what a lot of politicians want you to believe. Uh, I, I try to bring the, 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 the experts together, and, and not just people with one tunnel vision of one viewpoint. I'd like to get a lot of different viewpoints. Uh, uh, I bought and turned around a potato chip company in, in Chicago a, a number of years ago, about 25 years ago. Uh, it's called Jay's Potato Chips, and it was losing $17 million a year on $100 million in sales. It was a losing enterprise. And, and I, I bought it with a, a few other investors, and uh, I recruited. I didn't know how to make potato chips. I didn't know how to distribute them. I didn't know how to, you know, sell them into the stores. <laughs> I know how to eat them. <laughs> I know how to eat them. <laughs> uh, but I brought together a bunch of people that knew how to do those things, and I said, okay, here's the goal: a profit. How do we attack each aspect of this and build a bridge from losing 17 million to making three million? That's what we need to do in California. We need to build a lot of bridges. We need to build a bridge from a, a state that has a failing school system in many, many areas to one that's successful for everybody. Maybe it's not gonna be a Cadillac for everybody, but it's gonna be far more successful than the existing one. So I'm all about bringing in experts and bringing in people from other states, looking at best practices, looking at what works everywhere else. And that's what a business person does. I mean, a business person looks for solutions. You know, you don't try to, you know, impose my own.
Hey, uh, Julie? Yeah, please. Great. Julie's going to yes. talk about the environment. Right. Um, in, in the context of a question about climate change and a debate in February, you said we shouldn't have to break the backs of taxpayers and the working people of the state in order to keep the air clean. I wonder if, if you could clarify a, a bit uh, and maybe provide the context what you meant by that. Are you well, let me, let, that let me go on the record right now. Money for that? Sure. Thank let, me, you. let me go on the record right now. I do not like dirty air. <laughs> uh, as a matter of fact, I told an audience yesterday that uh, I was here in 1968. My, my mom was a bridge player. and. I think the Summer Nationals were in Los Angeles in 1968. My, my grandparents actually moved out here in 1968, too. Uh, my, my aunt taught uh, at Stanford, uh, at the Stanford Medical School, my Aunt Ruth. And uh, so my grandparents moved from Chicago uh, uh, to a, a place in Mountain View. I wish they'd have bought the whole town. By the way. <laughs> That's another story. Uh, yeah, anyway. Well, I, I have no doubt that you don't, you don't like dirty air and right. I, I would imagine that the folks you're selling uh, property to in Indiana wouldn't live here if, if the air was the way it was say in the 60s. And I, I agree. I'm wondering what role the state has to play. Are you well, saying that the state I think the state putting money into these programs that they cost too much? No, I think that I think we need to do a cost benefit analysis on everything we do. And, and I think that's oftentimes missing. Uh, yes, let's have the air as clean as we can get it considering the fact that we also want humans to be able to live as well. It, it, it does no service to people to force them into poverty to get the cleanest, cleanest, cleanest air if they can't live and can't enjoy a life. And so, you know, I think innovation is key to this. I drive a Tesla. Uh, it's a wonderful car and it's clean. Uh, I want more clean cars. I think, I think we will be able to have clean burning internal combustion engines. Uh, I think innovation is the savior on that. Uh, I believe in clean water, but I also think we need to conserve water and we have need, you know, recycling on a cost benefit analysis is, is a good thing. Uh, so I'm, I'm all for cleaning the environment and keeping it clean and making it even cleaner than it already is, but I don't want to do it at the sufferance of, uh, and I guess everything is relative in terms of sufferance, right? Uh, but I think that, some, that perspective of risk versus reward, cost versus benefit, uh, you know, I, I face it every day in my own business. I, I, I could spend X dollars to make my properties, you know, just as perfect as can be, and they would be so expensive nobody would be able to live in them. And so I can't do that because people need to be able to live. And so I think that... Like it sounds like your calculation is, uh, in terms of cost-benefit, looks at uh, uh, financial cost-benefit and is excluding public health cost-benefit. So in an analysis no. you just made, talking about poor people and, and sufferance, they're the very people who are exposed to the worst air quality in the state. Uh, it's not the wealthy people who have to do, who are the benef beneficiaries of uh, some of the investments. So I, I guess I'm wondering what, what you mean when you say the cost benefit. If it costs too much money to business to implement a regulation, would you then not do that? Or would you take into account the, a greater public good in terms of public health and welfare? Well, again, uh, I think it's all a cost-benefit analysis. Uh, yeah, you're right. People who live in areas where there's a lot of industry, and because it's industry, it, it may give off pollution, uh, they suffer more than other people. And I think public officials should consider that and should weigh that, and that should be an element of the cost that's associated with a regulation. And so uh, I certainly don't want to see people injured by public health nuisances. So that's, that's you know, that's uh, a cost benefit that would enter into the picture. All I'm saying is, is that oftentimes with a lot of regulations in this state, we don't necessarily consider the cost benefit. We just go ahead and just regulate and restrict to a degree and, and add cost to the system. I mean, a lot of times these things add significant costs 
to the system, and, and that cost is borne by the very people you're talking about. Uh, just remember, you know, if, if gasoline costs five dollars or eight dollars a gallon, I, I'm not going to be. It's not going to bother my life too much. I mean, I'm, I've been reasonably successful, and so it's uh, it's not going to impact my life. But it's going to certainly impact a working person's life, and and we've got to we've got to keep that in mind. Uh, and that's all I'm saying. Uh, there's there's a there's a reward. Well, it, it, and, 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 the remedy, I mean, CEQA already, the, the, the state's environmental quality law does require a cost-benefit analysis, and it, it's taken into account. But I'm, I'm wondering... We yeah, but who, who, in, who, who interprets that? I don't want to... Yeah, go ahead. Well, whatever agency is overseeing the project. I mean, it is a requirement uh, along with, I mean, there, as you imagine, and I'm sure you don't approve of, there are many, many requirements uh, for environmental regulations, and there is a cost-benefit analysis, and, and it is a fiscal cost or a, an economic cost, but it also weighs equally um, public health, which is usually the nexus with it, the, the reason behind environmental laws. And I'm, it, it sounds like your, your, your background and your predilection is to remove these regulations and let industry get out of the way, let it go about its business, and, no. and it'll it will get regulated, it'll self-regulate? I don't think it, so no, 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 mm. no, 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 I'm, I'm not for self-regulation per se, uh, and, and I think you're putting words in my mouth. Uh, I'm, I'm for rational, accountable decision making. I'm also for rational regulation that doesn't give incentives to litigants and, you know, frankly, uh, you know, the, the, the provisions of CEQA in particular uh, have, uh, have, have been used by litigants to hold up uh, other uh, developments, to uh, be used against competitors. Labor unions have used them to get better uh, terms on, on, uh, on, on wages and benefits. Uh, all I'm, all I'm saying is that the, the balance is out of whack, and uh, my predilection is certainly to have clean air and clean water, but also to allow an economy to grow and prosper, because that, frankly, benefits the people that we're talking about more than anybody else. If you were governor, would you roll back Jerry Brown's cap and trade? Absolutely. I mean, frankly, that is another tax on, a regressive tax on people that, I mean, all taxes are paid by consumers, you understand. You know, you can say you're taxing a business, but that business is just going to pass the tax along. They're just a collection agent. And the cap and trade tax was basically a tax, you know, and it's, a lot of it's being used to fund the high speed rail, which uh, I feel is a monument to corruption uh, and, uh, and, and mismanagement. Uh, but uh, you know, the cap and trade tax is, is raising the price of gasoline, and the gasoline cost is already so high for working people in the state. It's regressive, it is counterproductive, and uh, I would most certainly roll that back. May I? Uh, and yet, it's, an, it's, a, it's a scheme that has raised $6 billion for a lot of projects that would have either gone unfunded. Um, or underfunded in the state that would that go to the to the, the goals that you would like to achieve of clean air and clean water. Well, uh, were those we we don't, probably don't have time right now to talk about each and one, every one of those projects. But I, I think what we need to make sure is that we get full transparency and we get a full cost benefit analysis of each one of those projects, and that it be done by people that don't have a stake in them and aren't looking to raise money or get a job uh, with some uh, entity after they leave government. Uh, I, I think that's one of the big issues here too, is the, is the tie-in and the nexus between people who uh, work in government and, and are connected to organizations and businesses and other people who benefit from some of these projects. Um. Along the lines of high-speed rail, you're airing an ad, uh, I guess, in the Central Valley now, yeah. which you're going after Villaraigosa for his support of high-speed rail. Is high-speed rail just a non-starter as far as you're concerned? Well, the way it was done, yeah. Uh, it, was, it was done in the Central Valley uh, because a, a couple of congressmen traded their vote for Obamacare to get it built out there. Uh, 
the you know the, the outward rationale was that it was going to be easier to do out there. Well, uh, it was approved before Obama was elected. By the voters, of course, of course, but not necessarily started in that area. Uh, and of, of course, the other part of it is that that there were proposals to build that in down the middle of the five, which probably oh I, I read it I read it read okay. about the the company that built the TGV in France submitted a, a a proposal to build it you know the five you you already have all the overpasses you have all the rights away you didn't have to you know buy any land. Uh, you know, there's a, there's a lot of things that could have been done in that way, too. Uh, you know, frankly, it's taken so long and so over budget. Uh, we now have something, you know, I think that's promising. The Hyperloop, uh, I think, is a promising technology that, that could be used. That would be, you know, even in two hours and 40 minutes, uh, given the advances in, in air travel and some of the other things that we've been able to achieve, uh, I even think that's outmoded these days. Uh, Frankly, the self-driving car, you know, we, we're, we're a little bit, you know, that maybe that's a little far afield now, but I think there's some other technologies that are out there that, that may well uh, make it uh, uh, obsolete today. So, uh, so you would stop it? If I you would. would. I would. You would have to go back to the voters, I would guess, because they did approve the bond. Yeah. I think, I think, again, full transparency. I'd like to see an audit done of the money that was spent, by the way. Uh, I think it was pointed that uh, the legislature rejected and the governor rejected the idea of an audit. I think full transparency. You know, if there's one thing, again, uh, that I can't stand is corruption. And, you know, people who are afraid of having their finances disclosed in that fashion probably ought to be worried about it. Um, um, if I, I'm sorry, Pat. Uh, can we uh, just stay on the environment for a little while? Well, okay. Um, going back to climate change, and I don't know if can speak to this, but there is a concern uh, among some researchers um, and scientists that um, rising sea levels are going to be affecting the state, uh, hitting it partic particularly hard. Is there anything that the state lawmakers should be doing to prepare for that? You know, that's above, uh, I guess I'll use the Obama line, it's above my pay grade. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, I'm not a climatologist. Uh, I know that there are opinions on both sides of that. Uh, you know, it's always portrayed that it's all one-sided on that, and I don't believe that, by the way. I've done some level of, of you know, research and, and talking to different groups. So uh, do you believe climate change is I think the climate is always changing. I think the climate is changing. I, you know, I think there, there are like some aspects of it. I'm not sure how much humans cause it uh, or that we can do anything about it or that it's even beneficial to do something about it, frankly. Uh, it's change. There's no question about that. The world has changed. We, we had a little ice age a few centuries ago. I mean, yeah. <laughs> so, so and but, real quickly, because I know we need to move on, but, but right. a quick question on the forests, because the state has mass dying trees and we have huge wildfires. We've had. I think there's serious wins. problems. I think it's incredible that we what live should, in terror of forest fires. So, what should the state be doing? I think we need a, the next forest fire. We need a lot better management. Uh, we need we need uh, we need to uh, thin the forests more. Uh, we need to uh, we need to allow more logging than we are. Uh, you know, logging is a good thing. Uh, you know, f forests are the ultimate renewable. I mean, you, you, you know, and, and anybody who owns a forest wants it renewed. They're going to plant trees and they're going to have growth. Uh, so uh, the idea that we're, we're hindering logging uh, when it's a, a wonderful business, by the way, and can contribute to economic growth and jobs and, you know, Reducing the wage gap and the inequality gap, I think that would be a wonderful thing. Yeah, uh, although Julie can speak to this, a lot of the trees, the, the bulk of the trees that are dying off in the Sierra right now, loggers don't want them. Yeah, companies don't want them. That so may well be the case. Them. Well, that may be the case, and we need to have a, you know, we need to have some programs to manage that and get rid of some of those trees and, and thin them. Well, there's some cost to it. Maybe there's some use that we could use to, you know, to apply to that. I, I'd like to see if I could bring in private invest in, investment to, to do some of that. Um, you know, again, it's all about with experts, people mar far more expert than me on how to reduce fire risk as well as to, uh, to, to repurpose uh, those dead trees. Uh, the other issue is uh, fire breaks, uh, building roads into the forest to, you know, be able to get equipment back there to, to better manage fire suppression. Uh, I think that's not been done very much. Uh, I think we have to have better equipment. Um, frankly, 
We are spending a lot of money on CAL FIRE. If you go, go to a website called Transparent California, and you'll see uh, you know, our, our salaries and our benefits for a lot of fire workers are border on the uh, uh, excessive. Let's put it that way. Equipment costs are pretty high, too. Mm -hmm. And equipment costs are very high, too, but when you're paying so much for overtime and for other costs and, you know, the, the rules for, you know, I, I, I read that uh, a lot of firefighters take their, uh, their vacation at the beginning of the month so that every hour they work after that is all overtime. Uh, now, that's not their fault. I'm not going to pin that on them. I'm going to pin that on management. That's management. You know what I mean? If, if my employees take advantage of policies that I've created, that's on me. That's not on them. And, and that's the problem in the state. Uh, the politicians who are the managers, per se, uh, almost have no interest in policing this. And, uh, you know, one of my opponents, as you know, uh, Mr. Villaraigosa was the head, you know, was the Speaker of the House when they increased the accrual from 2% to 3% uh, for, for pensions. And, and that wasn't considered to be very, all that controversial at the time. We, know now, we now know that that was basically a cup of hemlock for our, uh, you know, for our financial situation. Uh, I mean, uh, the, our unfunded pension debt is existential. And frankly, one of, the, you know, one of the main reasons I'm running for governor, because I look at that as a huge cost. That's in the cost of our fire protection. Our, our compensation cost is a very important part of that, and it's got to be dealt with. And we could afford more equipment, and we could afford better equipment, and we could afford more early warning detection equipment for fires. I mean, I think it's horrendous that, that we had the deaths that we had in, the, in, in Santa Rosa and the loss of houses. And think about that. That's another tax on the poor because the loss of those houses resulted in what? Billions of dollars of insurance claims? Not, the loss of life was horrendous, but the billions of dollars of insurance claims, and that's going to be paid by every single policyholder. I'll pay it, but I can afford it. But the, people who, the working people of this state are now being hit with another tax, and that is a insurance tax because their insurance premiums are going to go up because we failed, we failed them in terms of managing the forests and managing the fire suppression. All right, let's so go to help. That's mismanagement. Um, uh, what do you think, if anything, should be done to provide health care for illegal immigrants? Illegal immigrants are not legally allowed to be in the country. They stop. They they cut in line. I understand. I don't. I don't. I think there are, are certainly humanitarian efforts that businesses that healthcare can 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 make to give benefits. But I don't believe in giving benefits to people who have broken the law to come to the country. Now, I believe that this is a huge problem. We have a couple million people who are here and broken the law and we've got to get federal work to, to work to, to get this problem solved and there's got to be pressure applied at the federal level and we, and we need to work with the federal government and cooperate with the federal government. I know these are strange terms in this city these, this, uh, these days but I, I believe in cooperation and, and working together and uh, you know the, the needs of our uh, illegal alien community are, are there and they're here and it's a failure of the federal government to and, secure and the border. If they're here and if they have a heart attack or if they contract cancer or whatever, what should we do? Well, I, I'm a humanitarian, you know, I mean I started a charity that repairs the homes of elderly and disabled people that couldn't afford it in Chicago, so I certainly believe in providing humanitarian assistance to people. Again, I'd like to you know, I think one of the things that we could do is try to bring down the cost structure of health care. Uh, and I think a large part of that is, again, encouraging more competition and more price transparency and more involvement of patients and doctors. So, uh, so if they're here and if they get sick, you think we should provide health care for them? I think there's a humanitarian element that the people of this state can make a decision on and they can decide if they want to provide humanitarian health care to people who are here illegally. I'd rather see a solution to the problem. Uh, they, they, 
go back and reapply or they are they are they are they're allowed to stay with a long-term fix to have them ultimately become legal residents not citizens but legal residents I don't think anybody should become a citizen who uh, came to the country and, and, and cut in line because I don't think that's fair to the people who are waiting in line I mean I was in Argentina a year ago and I saw people all around the block at the US Embassy waiting in line to come legally what do you say to them when they know that people cut in line I, you know does that apply to DACA kids? Well, DACA is a whole other story uh, because obviously those are kids that are now here. They were born here. They not born here, came here as kids. well. They may have come here as as kids. You're right. Not born here because if they were born here, they would be citizens. Um, although I'm not going to get into that. Uh, I, I, you know, the DACA. I think the president actually put forth a, a good plan. Uh, the president's a businessman like me. I mean, he wants to get a solution. Uh, he put forth uh, an offer, which I thought was very generous, to, to not only legalize the 800,000 DACA kids, but to go further. And, and, and the other party didn't want it. Uh, you know, I think they want to keep it alive as an issue. I, I don't think they want a solution. I think they, no, I really do. No, I, I'm not disagreeing with you. I think, I think they like the, the arguments and the fights. Frankly, I think they like it because it takes people's minds off the price of gasoline and the price of their house and the price of their rent and the price of their water and their electricity and the fact that they're working two and three jobs to try to scrape by and on poverty level. Uh, uh, you know, it, it's, I, you know, the, 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 the Democrats don't seem to have an answer for those things. I mean, that's, that's basically their mismanagement that's resulted in those things. So they'd rather, they'd much rather talk about DACA and fighting the, uh, you know, President Trump. One of your uh, opponents um, suggested uh, uh, building uh, uh, facilities to house homeless people, mentally ill homeless people. Um, Mr. Newsom's come out with a fairly long, detailed plan about dealing with severely mentally ill people. What What do you think should be done with severely mentally ill people? Maybe. You Pass them on the street as you I think we need to get. Here. I think we need to get people care, but we need to get people care that moves them from illness to, to some reasonable semblance of health. I happen to have some experience with mental illness and my, my family, and so I know that you can't cure schizophrenia to some degree. Or you know, there's there's some academic discussion about that. Again, I'm not an expert, on this. Um, but. You can you can make it functioning, and you can and you can you can transition people from being on the street to being somewhat productive. That's an element, by the way, of the homeless situation that needs to be dealt with. I do not agree with state-run institutions. Uh, you know, I saw those growing up in in Illinois. Uh, a lot of those, you know, because they were managed by the state and they weren't competitive, uh, and they were, you know, again, I don't believe government does most things well. And why? Because it's not competitive. It's not subject to the free market. If you don't like what the government's doing, are you going to go somewhere else? No. What I do believe in are public-private partnerships. I mean, there's a wonderful group uh, right in Carlsbad near me that's called Solutions for Change. It's a charity I've been involved with and I've donated to it. And they transition homeless people. They, they deal with the substance abuse. And I'd like to see the state working with programs like that, but, but with determined, defined metrics so that you get somebody in, you've got a time frame and you've got to meet that time frame. If you don't meet that time frame for transitioning them to some semblance of, you know, progress, we go somewhere else and we, and we, we put them somewhere else should, that, that, that can be, be able to compel treatment of mentally ill people. I think the state should enforce its vagrancy laws and, 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 and by doing that, I think it would, would be a, 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 a compulsion. Uh, I think there's an avenue for, it's a public health hazard. Uh, somebody compared it to, you know, London in the 1600s with the bubonic plague. I mean, we've got human waste on the streets. Uh, they cleaned up the Santa Ana Trail and there were 16,000 hypodermic needles or something like that that were picked up. I mean, we are doing people no favors to let them live on the streets in those conditions. So there, there, there probably will have to be some level of compulsion uh, associated with this. Absolutely, because it hurts other people. It hurts the community. Should we change the law in a way that would permit the state to more readily compel treatment for severe mental illness? I think there's an avenue to, to look at that, absolutely. Again, I think 
we need experts to tell us the, the circumstances under which that can be done and uh, the protections that need to be had. I mean, I absolutely believe in uh, civil rights and, and due process. So I do not believe in taking away someone's right to live or you know, move about uh, without giving them due process and giving them the right amount of uh, uh, ability to defend themselves. Um, again, the homeless problem is, is, is substance abuse. It's also the, the prisons and, and the issue the, of reclassifying felonies and, and, and that issue. Uh, because a lot of a lot of the people on the streets now are people who were let out of prison and you know didn't have you know a way to you know fend for themselves. I want to pivot back to the hemlock problem. <laughs> the, uh, so you know yeah. if, the if pension. The pension, yeah. Mm -hmm. If if you're if if you're governor, um, what would you what would you do? You know, would you carry on Governor Brown's fight in in the courts in the Supreme Court about uh, the right to? modify benefits on pros prospective work, the California rule? I, what, what, what sort of yeah, this is, this is a real thorny, thorny problem because the law was changed in 1999, as you know, so we're talking 19 years ago, which means that people haven't saved like they should have saved because they were sitting there counting on this pension. And so, you know, those people were probably going to have to be protected, of course. Uh, you know, we made some promises that are allowing people to retire at, at really young ages and then they go off and work somewhere else and get another salary uh, you know I think that's a potential issue that that needs to be put before people uh, I'm again I'm gonna look for a lot of solutions to this problem uh, I don't think we can have people retire on, on 90 percent of their pay at night at age 53 I, I just don't think that's economically feasible Right, and so this this is why the, it's so pivotal before the Supreme Court right now. What Jerry Brown's doing and arguing that the legislature and, and yeah, but he's defending his modest reforms. His reforms were tiny. Right, but in prin the principle that you can make adjustments on work that you haven't done on future work, right? I mean that. It, right. It, it, assuming no one's, everyone seems to be in agreement that we can't touch the work that's already been done. Right. But it's about the work state workers or local workers now and the work, future work, can you modify the benefits going forward? That in principle, is that something that you would support? Uh, yes. And, 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 and I, I'm in the private sector, that's not even an issue. I mean, if I, if I have a business that's not working very well and I, I have benefits that aren't affordable and the business isn't working, you know, I, I, I'm going to have to tell people we can't give, you know, we can't keep accruing these future benefits. They may decide to quit and go somewhere else. Uh, that's their choice, but you know, uh, uh, people don't have an inherent right to work for the government, and uh, you know, they'll 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 have to make that decision. That'll be an element of the decision. May, they may decide to go work in the private sector, but if the state has a program that's just totally you know un unsustainable, which you know this this one is to some degree, uh, it's got to be modified. Um, by our estimates, you know, the, the amount of pension we're paying now as a state at all different, you know, state and local levels is now $25 billion a year. You know, what it's projected to go much, much higher. Yeah, and this is just, just this is just, you know, what we put in each year. It's I not, know. It's not the end I liability. know. Oh, yeah. But, uh, what, you know, how would you try to tackle that? Because, it, you know, the problem seems to be having a greater impact at local government level. It is. It's, it's all effective. Because what happened is, is when the state did it in 1999, they only did that uh, change in accrual for health, health and safety workers, if you remember, public safety workers. And of course, everybody wanted it after that time. And so, and, and they wanted it at every level. So every public safety worker in every county and every city wanted it. And of course, politicians, because they were giving away other people's money, and, and worse, by the way, other people's money who weren't even born yet. Uh, they, they felt no compunction to do that. Uh, and again, that's irresponsible. You know, it, it should be noted that, that I'm the only governor candidate talking about revamping our political system to allow this to be done. You know, I mean, you know, Mr. Newsom and, you know, Mr. Villagrosa all, you know, wax, you know, poetic uh, uh, at these forums on things that they're going to, you know, get done and the, you know, the changes they're going to make in sequel and all these other things that they're going to do. 
the funding sources in the state are so significant that uh, you know we need to reform the system as well. And I'm going to be talking about that. I know we're getting close on time, so yeah. if I can kind of do a quick lightning round. With sure. You. Death penalty coming up. How do you handle that as governor? Well, you know, it's public record. I'm, I, I, I oppose the death penalty on financial grounds as well as moral grounds. I'm a, I'm a Catholic, and I, I, I just don't believe in taking life, uh, but I believe in punishment. So I'm in favor of punishment. Right. But if as governor, will you, would you allow for yes. to be executed? Yes. I, would, I, I, I also believe in the law, so I'm not going to put my own personal predilections ahead of the law. Our, our, our state is a nation or a state of laws, despite sanctuary state, uh, which I would get rid of. <laughs> I would work hard to get rid of because it's, it is. It's against the law. It's, it's against the rule of law. The reason we have a wonderful economy, the reason we have the success and the great place to live today is because we respect the rule of law in this, in this state and in this country. Let me ask you about non-disclosure agreements for sexual harassment. There's a push to abolish them so that people wouldn't be able to enter into them. What do you think? I think it's, first of all, I think it's horrendous that we have state legislators that do this kind of thing. As you might know, I let... This would be for private business, too. So what do you think about... Well, I think private people should be allowed to, to enter into contracts. I don't think government should restrict contracts for, in the private sector. Uh, but as you know, I led the recall of Bob Filmer. And I, I, you know, I, I abhor, I have four daughters. I abhor the idea that, you know, workplace sexual harassment would take place. And I think it's even more horrendous that, that our politicians and, and Mr. Chung, uh, you know, just winked at this stuff and let this happen and let, you know, big settlements get paid to employees without any disclosures. So ban them in the public sector? But Absolutely. Okay. Well, but you know, private people can contract. I don't have any problem with that. I mean, you know, obviously there's public policy grounds for if there's a crime committed, right. you know, there's public policy that would prevent a contract from disclosing a, a crime that being committed. And Sacramento, as you know, has been rocked by a police shooting, which we have from time to time in California. Yeah. And there have been calls in the legislature to do a number of things to change the law, give the state a larger role in these. If a bill got to your desk that would have the require the state, the Attorney General, the Justice Department to get involved in pol local police investigations if there's a police shooting so that local police aren't policing themselves, what would you do? Well, I certainly think that the independent commissions and things could be done. I don't know that it's a state province to do that. I mean, I think, uh, again, the more things that this are done that are locally, I, I much prefer that because I believe the local community is more attuned to what's going on and, and will understand things a lot more. Uh, I, I certainly think that police and police unions shouldn't be involved in these investigations. There should be an independent, there should be full transparency. Uh, you know, this, this shooting here in Sacramento was tragic and uh, I think it, it's a, it's a, uh, uh, it points up the need for more communication between the community and the police. Having said that, the, you know, being a police officer is a tough job. You know, this, this was late at night, a lot of, you know, a lot, of, a lot of fear. I mean, I, I saw, it was in Massachusetts, but a, a policeman serving a warrant was shot in the head by somebody just walking up to a door and delivering a warrant. I mean, come on. You know, we, 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 should, we should know that it's a dangerous profession, uh, and I, I would hope the leaders of the community would, would, would say, first of all, it's, it's not a smart thing to be running them from the police when they tell you to stop. You should stop. Mm. But, but, but on the other hand, you shouldn't have been executed for that. Last quick question. So uh, um, my colleague Laurel Rosenhall isn't here, but she's asked all of the governor's candidates to share publicly any questionnaires that they provide to special interest groups in seeking an endorsement. Would you be willing to do that? And if not, why not? Uh, that's an interesting question. I mean, I, I don't know if they, they, the, in, the groups themselves, I mean, are you talking about groups like education groups and uh, other groups? Uh, you know, maybe they don't want it shared. I don't know. Uh, I, I'll get back know, to you. I know she would say, but you are representing, you're asking the people you know, to vote for you. So wouldn't the public have a right to know a candidate's private communications and promises that they might make to special You've declined interest. that with Laurel, with Laurel so far, so you let her know that. Yeah, I mean, I've participated in, I don't know, what, 10 forums already? I mean, you know, and, and, I, and I'll, be I'll tell you, I, I don't believe there's any instance that I put down something in a, in a 
you know, questionnaire, not that I've even done that many, frankly, uh, that I wouldn't say in public necessarily. But, uh, you know, I, 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 I'm entirely consistent on positions that I take. You know, can I ask you about the, the race? Uh, just in the last 48 hours, we've seen it's getting more interesting, I guess. Um, yeah. Uh, you know, with this eight and a half million dollars that went to Spia Ragoza with the, or the I, IEs. I hope you'll side. do something about my opponent, uh, my Republican opponent's uh, <laughs> violation of the law. I mean, you know, if there wasn't as clear a violation of the, of the PP, FPPC with this this contribution he got that he's now going to put on ads, you know, it, it was ostensibly contributed to his ballot measure committee. Did you read about this? I read all about this. <laughs> well, maybe not enough because there ought to be action. Really and truly. Well, I'll at least send you the work I did for the Mercury News on this. Really? Yeah. I mean, I think it's a disgrace. I really do. And, you know. Send some money to ballot measure committees ostensibly for ballot measures, but then you can basically spend it on whatever you want. Well, and. <laughs> What's, what's worse about this, by the way, is it's, it's a defunct ballot measure. See, that's the other part of it. That's the part, I think. If it was a valid ballot measure, the law is a little gray, this kind of stuff. You have to say which ballot measure you're supporting or opposing when you create these committees. Well, okay. Maybe it's unethical. Maybe it's not illegal. But the point is, you know, to a defunct, when you know that there's another ballot measure that I'm involved with, <laughs> That, he's, that, that, that could use the money, by the way, <laughs> and then he goes and uses this for his own campaign. I mean, a person that does that it shouldn't be anywhere near the levers of power. I don't care which party they're at. Uh, that, that, frankly, that action, I think, uh, casts a pall on the Republican Party, as far as I'm concerned. And, and, uh, and, and, I, and, it's, and, it's, and it's, you know, we can, he and I can differ on policy, whether I voted for Donald Trump or not, or all these other things. But doing so, the sharp practice, I call it a sharp practice. That's what we call it in the private sector, like that. I don't take shortcuts like that. I, I've prided myself. I've been in business for 40 years. I, I, I run my businesses with integrity. I value my reputation. And frankly, the Republican Party values its reputation. And to have someone in who does something like this, several congressmen have spoken up about this, by the way, you know. Oh, I didn't see that. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. Yeah, ben, I know Ben wants to ask about uh, that. This is something I, you're going to want to talk I, I about. I want to finish with this question too. Could do you? Uh, it's just something we need for. Okay. Okay. It, it's just that um, tax revenue for the state of California is notoriously volatile. Um, are there any structural changes you, you would suggest to the tax code that would balance that out, prepare us for the next recession? Um. I'm not a fan of the income tax in general. Uh, you know, I don't know why Texas and Florida don't have income taxes, and we do. Uh, that in I'd like to see it greatly reduced or eliminated. I think, you know, there's this idea out there that's tax the rich, tax the rich, tax the rich. And of course, that feeds people, you know, who don't understand these things. You know, we pay taxes. Consumers pay all taxes. Uh, you know, the rich own the farms, the factories, the natural resources. They just increase the prices they pay, you know, that we pay. And, you know, and it's a very inefficient thing to do, uh, and and it's hurting the state because it's it's causing people to to move out, uh, it's causing businesses to move out, uh, it's uh, you know it's 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 uh, frankly counterproductive. And Texas, you notice, are growing. Florida is growing. Uh, they're getting tons of businesses and tons of people moving there that that we could use here in California. Um, what other tax would you raise, or what service? Well, would first you of all, we need a we need to cut spending to a large extent. The housing crisis alone, doing something like that, could cut twenty percent out of our budget because of the cost of housing and the salaries and everything that, that we have to pay. Uh, and people would end up having more effective pay. Um, but the waste in this government. Uh, Caltrans spends four dollars and fifty cents for every dollar Texas spends on a mile of road. I mean, these are statistics I get from other people, and, and they've been proved. They've been fact-checked. Uh, we spend multiples of what other states spend on on so many things. Uh, you know, there is so much. You know, look at the cost of education. So I've heard from so many administrators that tell me they've had to add 
so many administrative people on school districts all across the state because of the paperwork and the reporting requirements and things. In a day and age where, you know, I ran a, I ran a law firm with 13 lawyers and one secretary in 1987, and it was a whole networked office of Apple Macintoshes in 1987. And why? Because I had an incentive to keep administrative costs down and keep my fees down to get better business. And that's what I did. Do you think that kind of incentive exists anywhere in government? I'm here to tell you it's the opposite. Because the more people you have working in government, the more bodies you have, the more dues they pay. The more dues they pay, the more power the union bosses have. The more power the union bosses have, they give it to the politicians to, you know, elect them. We have the... Yeah, this may restrict uh, that. It may help, but it's not going to win the day, I'm afraid. Uh, but it, but it'll, it'll certainly help. Uh, compulsory dues, you know. But, you know, the, believe me, enough people will pay the dues that the incentive structure. We need to get a government that has an incentive. You know, it took me three hours to get my driver's license. I always love this story. I even had an appointment. People say to me, well, you should have had an appointment. No, I made an appointment. <laughs> it took me three hours. I had steam coming out of my ears by the time I left that DMV. In Florida, when I moved there about 15, 20 years ago, it took me 15 minutes to get my new license. Wow, I thought DMV sucked everywhere. <laughs> no. It, you know, and, and so, you know, this idea that Florida and Texas have no state income tax and are run relatively well tells me that we have a lot of improvement to do. That's kind of one of the reasons I love running for this position. There's a lot of mismanagement and a lot of improvements I can make. Uh, I'm going to have fun turning around this state because we call it low-hanging fruit in the business world. There's a lot of low-hanging fruit in this state to, to improve. And, uh, and I'm, I'm looking forward to, to building a team of business people like myself that will come into government and re-engineer re it and reinvent it. I'm here to tell you, Gavin Newsom isn't going to do that. Via Rogosa isn't going to do that. And why? Because the people funding their campaigns don't want that. What do you, how do you see the next couple of weeks before the primary? Is this a race for second place? And is it you well, and Diego Goza? Uh, the top two is another you know, issue we, we, should, you know, we could talk about for an hour. Right. And he stood up, so yeah. he wants me to get so the heck out of here. Uh, <laughs> uh, you know, I, I'm going to continue to get the issues out. You know, the story I told you, we were talking about, the, I was in TSA line this, this morning, and I just happened to mention a guy that was running for governor, you know, the, the TSA worker. He was a veteran, lived in San Diego, you know, moved to San Diego 35 years ago. He just un, unsolicited, and I told him I was running for governor, but unsolicited, he said, oh, my God, I can't believe what's happened to this state for the last 30 years. I mean, it is just horrendous to live here. I, I can't believe some of the things that are being done, the roads, the schools, the cost of electricity, water, gasoline, all this stuff is going up incredibly. I can barely make a living, uh, but I don't, want, I don't want to leave. My kids are here, you know, I, I got, you know, uh, what am I going to do? I'm, I'm voting for you. And, and the woman in front of me in line <laughs> heard this whole discussion. She said the same thing. And, you know, this is on Southwest, by the way. These aren't, you know, these aren't, you know, people from Rancho Santa Fe. These are just normal people. I'm, I'm hitting this all over the state. People just want something to change. And, and I think they think a business person is the right way to go. That and what difference Even if it's that, a conservative. That money that came in from Rio Goza, will that make a difference? And if so, I yeah. mean, can you see yourself putting more of your own money in the race? Or? Yeah, uh, no comment. <laughs> uh, you know, I shouldn't have to fund this. The people of the state, and by the way, they, they, are, they are responding. You know, I mean, every single day, ever since the poll came out that I'm in second place, we've been generating probably around 10,000 a day online. And I think that's going to grow the more you do your jobs, which you will. You'll, you'll talk about the plans that I have, and I'm sure you'll put it in the best light possible. <laughs> uh, but the, the point is, you know, I, I'm here to try to solve the problems, and I think that's what people want, and I think they'll respond. And, and, and the, the history of self-funders in the state is not good. I'm not a self-funder. I've started it, but I'm hoping that the people of this state will 
will, will respond and because they want to see a positive change. All right? Thank you very much for visiting Cal Matters, and you've been very generous with your time. And yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Well, Great to have you here. I, I enjoy it, by the way. <laughs> they, don't, they don't enjoy it, but I enjoy it. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, Appreciate we'll talk it. talk more with you about ballot measure committees. Oh, that. good. Oh, yeah. Anytime. Well, yeah. particularly this one, I have a particular interest in. Thanks again. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you very much. Thanks for coming. Thank you, Brian. Let me grab your Brian. microphone. Oh, yeah. I've walked off with a couple of these from Fox News. Oh, we're, 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 we're a low budget shop. We can't, know, we can't yeah. afford yeah. free. Thank you very much. Have a good one. All right. All right.